Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hi Mavs fans, Kirk Henderson and Josh Bow coming to you for another episode of Mavs Moneyball After Dark. The Mavs lost to the Phoenix Suns, 111-105. to The Mavericks have now lost five straight for the first time since the 2018-19 season, which was rookie uh, Luka's rookie year. And they are, um, I don't know, for me, the the things just, just keep getting worse. This is a... This is a much worse loss to me um, than some of the previous ones we've dealt with because it's, it's, I mean, they had the game and then the team, the team lost it. Um, I want to talk about a key moment and what happened and why a little later in the podcast, because I don't think it was the reason, but the, the Mavericks had momentum and then they gave it all away. Yeah, um, I don't know. I'm frustrated with the loss, obviously, but at the, I mean, we shouldn't be saying this about NBA teams, but at least there was like, like they cared. <laughs> like mm-hmm. there was, I mean, we could argue about what you know how much of that level of effort disappeared in the fourth quarter, but I mean, at the very least, they were not getting their bl- doors blown off in the first quarter, uh, and they seemed like a relatively feisty team for you know, 40 minutes or so. And I know that we're not, when you're, when you're a team that had uh, the preseason expectations the Mavericks have, and you sit eight and 12 after your first 20 games and you've lost five in a row and you're two and five at home and, and you have your star player uh, a game ago saying that he's not sure what's going on because he seems like guys don't care. Like obviously things are bad and, and moral victories shouldn't really exist right now, but I'm just like, there's a part of my brain that's like, well, at least they responded. Like there was a, when you consider the circumstances, uh, Kirk, I think you said on our last podcast that the Mavericks were probably not going to get into their beds until like 3 a.m. or something, or, you know, a little after 3 a.m. and then play a basketball game tonight. Like I wouldn't have been shocked if we saw like another game that they played against the Suns uh, or that Houston game. Uh, so, like, I was genuinely enthused that they did some things in terms of keeping the game competitive and close. But, yeah, I can't really argue against you about just the way the game ended and the way it kind of slipped through their fingers. Uh, and we saw – what troubled me was we saw some kind of old nasty habits uh, reemerge in that fourth quarter, and that was disappointing. Well, it's more than the third quarter or fourth quarter. Let me read yeah. the numbers. So, at the 601 mark – of the uh, third quarter, Tim Hardaway Jr. made a 12-foot jumper to put the Mavs up 74-59. to 
Uh, the final score ended up being 111 to 105. So if you do the math there, it was a 52 to 31 closing effort by the Suns. And that is frankly unacceptable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Luka Doncic was the Mavs offense in the third quarter. And if you go into the box score, it was once again a piss poor effort by just about everybody else. Um, it's very frustrating to watch all these so-called perimeter players not be able to hit 50% of their shots. You know, Hardaway Jr., once again, you know, he's 3 of 10 from 3. Uh, Jason or Josh Richardson has been grossly disappointing. Uh, he's shooting 40% from the floor. That can't be. It, it, it just can't be. You know, he's shooting 28% from 3. Like, this is awful. And, and you know, Brunson came into the game again and, you know, was very Brunson-y. You know, he and Hardaway seem to be fighting for, like, the second guard spot, and neither one is really making a compelling case because, you know, Brunson's too short to defend, and, and Hardaway's is, is seems to, when he plays off the bench, he just doesn't play the same. I don't really – there's just so many problems. And, you know, we didn't even bring up the fact that Chris Stapps Porzingis didn't play at all, which was really telegraphed and we should have talked about last night. But the fact that he played in the fourth quarter – was a telltale sign that he wasn't going to play on the second end of back to back, but I didn't even think about him. I didn't think <laughs> about him until the Mavs were were almost about to lose the game. You know, they got the game of Willie Cauley Stein's life with fourteen points, nine rebounds, and four blocks. And you know, he really should have had more, but he did lots of dumb Willie Cauley Stein things. I know nobody's going to want to hear that because it's it's not you know. It's not fair. It's probably not. It's probably me being overly critical to any, in a sense. But as a starting center who gets who is Luka Doncic's role man, you have one of the easiest jobs in the NBA, and he just can't seem to finish buckets, um, or he would like catch it and pass out. I don't know. Like it's there's just so much wrong with these guys, and and I don't understand what the point of a lot of what their off season plan was if these guys aren't going to be able to play together because. Again, they're missing Maxi Kleba at this point. I think there's some arguments to be made about Richardson and Dorian Finney-Smith's wind. Brunson never had COVID, so it's it's kind of hard to say what's going on. Where he, you know, and he's actually played really well over the course of the season. As much as I don't like watching him play, that that's not the same thing. But there, there's some arguments to be made that these guys need to kind of find themselves again. And I think I think there's some validity to that. But the Mavericks don't have time. They are now four games under 500, 20 games into a 70 game season. Yeah, they're they are they are slowly running out of time. And that's why they really needed like they desperately needed to find a way. It, like I didn't care if they won this game, even missing every shot. Like if they would have somehow won this game with Phoenix like coughing it up, uh, I wouldn't have cared. Like they just needed to win. Uh and they didn't. And yeah, Josh Richardson has been a huge disappointment. And I think, you know, the preseason, the preseason, I think, you know, inflated a lot of what he could do. And even as someone who was a big fan of the move, you know, I thought that preseason people needed to tap the brakes because, you know, he was not. He <laughs> shot like 75% true. from three. Yeah, it, that was crazy. Um, but I'm willing to, I mean, Kirk, I don't know how to balance these two feelings where i'm willing to wait because the guy had covid uh and you know he was not on a basketball court basically for two weeks he was in a hotel room uh so i'm willing but at the at the other end of the spectrum you know he also wasn't playing particularly well when he uh went out of the lineup but also his healthy sample size in a mavericks uniform that's you know that pre those pre-covid you know he played like five games so I'm just really torn between wanting to give, you know, give these guys the time that they need, but at the end of the day, like they just have to win some games. Like there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like they got to just find a way to win because at the end of the day, like, you know, when we get toward the end of the season, the NBA is not going to be like, sorry, you know, here are your wins that you deserved that you got kind of screwed out of because half your team got COVID. Like that's just not going to happen. So yeah. Uh, and that sucks uh, because I want to give these guys more time because they deserve more time. But, at the end, you know, he still, you know, Richardson played 35 minutes and Finney Smith played 34 minutes. So, like, these guys, they've been thrown into the fire. I don't know yeah. if it made it worse or better or I don't no, know. I mean, Finney Smith has actually played relatively well. 
Yeah. Um, two games in a row, he shot the heck out of the ball from the corners, which is really where he, his bud, his bread has been buttered. Richardson is just something else entirely because he looks so out of sorts, and his shot is is Sean Marion esque. It is ugly. And it's kind of funny when he when he's off the dribble because it's so ugly that I don't think team realizes teams realize he's shooting, and so I I suppose there's the argument that you're making that you know given enough time maybe he'll feel more comfortable, but I I just I don't understand how because Luca teams are keying on Luca like this is it's a it's a perpetuating problem in that teams have keyed on Luca more and more as the year goes along where he's having to take more mid range jumpers which means the shooters are, are are sort of open because they're clogging the lane but they're, they're these rim runs for Luca are no are, aren't there like they were last year and and that's like a, a product of who is playing how they're playing uh the lack of verticality from Powell from Collie Stein and from KP it's just all these compounding problems with how basketball teams fit together and there's no real easy solution other than the guys who are getting open shots have to hit them Teams aren't respecting them, nor should they. It's it's the offense just died again. And you know, Zach Guthrie at a certain point, I, I would like to, you know, Carlo doesn't let assistants talk, but I would like to know what offense quote, you know, somebody called uh, Zach Guthrie, who was the guy brought in from Utah, an offensive guru. It was a source to DallasBasketball.com. Like a guru of what? Because their offense has regressed. Um I don't like a lot of what I'm seeing on either side of the ball. And there's just not an easy solution past NBA players need to stop derping around. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's just like, it's such an awful way to spend my time. I'm yeah, I so know. tired. I know, I, you know, our, our, our real lives are, they are what they are with everybody who is staying home and being smart and, and making, you know, decisions related to COVID. And then I, I, I stay up late on the East Coast to watch these games, which the, the NBA and the Mavericks are needlessly moving back by a half hour. For what? And and then I'm up till one in the morning most nights <laughs> to watch this team fail. It's very silly. Our yeah. overseas fans must be despondent. <laughs> I know. Um, Kirk, I wanted to go back to the offense. I think we should probably talk about what happened in, in the fourth quarter because really I think – for the first three quarters, I was okay with what I was seeing. And then the fourth quarter was where, like, the process was. Uh, Very old last out. year. Very yeah. last year. Um, if you're, uh, I got the the game by the play by play up, but I, I marked this, I made a mental note of this when I saw it. So with three minutes left, they're down 98 96, and the Mavericks have a really nice offensive possession. They're kind of pinging the ball around. They've got the Phoenix defense strung out. And what I was mm-hmm. hoping they would do. Uh, to close out the game is try to get DeAndre Hayden in space because the Suns basically play Aiton with four perimeter guys that are all relatively capable on defense. You know, Cam Johnson, Mikael Bridges, Jay Crowder, those guys can switch and guard pretty well. So the Mavericks love to run uh, a lot of small, small pick and rolls with Luca, like use Tim Hardaway Jr., use Dorian Finney-Smith, you know, maybe use Josh Richardson with a dribble handoff, like that kind of stuff. And if you're doing that against the Suns team down the stretch, you know they they're okay with that because they'll just they'll just switch it because they don't. If Mikhail is guarding Luca or Jay Crowder is guarding Luca, they're cool with it. So I really wanted them to try to isolate Aiton and try to get him in space and get him moving around uh, and force the Suns to react to that. And they this possession with three minutes left in the game, they did exactly that, and the ball pings around. It comes to Josh Richardson, open wing three pointer, uh, and he misses it. Um, and after that possession and that shot, I, I don't have, you know, I, I don't, I need to go back and, and watch it, but I swear, Kirk, after that possession, it immediately reverted back to, okay, Luke is going to walk the ball up. He's going to run one pick and roll. He's going to stand outside the three point line and hold the ball for 15 seconds and then just try to do something like last season's team that we saw where everyone just stood around and watched Luca. And I can't help but wonder if there was some, like did uh, maybe that missed shot was just really dispiriting. Maybe Luca saw it and was like, "Okay, uh, it's my you know I have to win the game," and he kind of reverted back to his bad habits because I think when Luca presses on himself a little too much, he can do some things that I disagree with in terms of holding onto the ball a lot, and that mm-hmm. really disappointed me because 
at the end of the day, like you said, the guy, like the solution is the roster. I don't think is going to dramatically change unless let's see what happens at the trade deadline. But I don't think they're going to make any trades in the next two weeks. So uh, they have to figure it out with the guys on the floor. And like, even if like, I understand, you know, when the guys aren't making shots, you know, well, let's just Luca do whatever he can do. But I would really just love if they just stuck with it and not abandon that, that and Luca not abandon the offense a little bit. Well, I, he's the offense and I like, you can call it out on coaching and play calling, but like he's the one with the ball in his hands. But go go through I'm going through the I've been going through the game log and Luca entered the game and he missed three shots in the final six minutes. But what really went you know, the game was tied at ninety six up and the Sun simply scored every time. Mm-hmm. That is much more damaging and this happened in the first sun sun's game i don't know if anyone remembers it because it was the first game of the year but the exact same thing happened where booker and paul went to work and the supposed defense of the mavericks was really for naught and it was the same deal um part of it oh sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you no it's okay Uh, i just want i just want to say uh interject that like it's that thing kirk where they miss shots and it totally deflates them on the defensive end sure I, and that, that that's been a thing I think with this team for the last year or two. Yeah, I I it's true, but you and this is where the shot making aspect comes into this because it's either one thing or the other. Like last yeah, yeah. season, Dorian Finney Smith like should have been a hero like four times, and the Mavericks couldn't get a stop. Only this time, it's like it, this season it's been the reverse where Luca serves a dime to somebody and they can't hit it. Uh, even reading through this, you know, like Luca misses a five foot shot. Finney Smith misses a three. Luca misses a driving floater and, and the floaters versus the rim stuff is what I was talking about earlier, where teams just don't respect the Mavs shooters, nor should they. And I just, I don't see a quit. I don't see an easy path out of this. I am really not upset as much as I am just despondent because I don't see where it gets easier um for for anybody because once again luca pours in the points i mean 29 uh eight boards and seven assists what more can what more can that guy do yeah efficient shooting 12 of 22 three of seven from three uh only four free throw attempts which i think goes back to what you're saying right he's just not there's no path for him to the basket this season i don't think and especially not last season and when you're, I mean, Kirk, their two best pick and roll play. I mean, <laughs> think about it. They don't have Kristaps has been bad this season. Dwight Powell is not the same, and Maxi Kleba has been out for three weeks. Those are all their best pick and roll bigs. And Luca is great in terms of individual one on one play. But what really unlocked him last season was how the Mavericks used the pick and roll and their spacing to open up driving lanes for him. And when Willie Cauley-Stein is setting a screen and there's Dorian Franny Smith and Josh Richardson on the, uh, you know, surrounding that pick and roll, like what, if you're a defense, what are you going to do? You don't care about, you don't even care about Willie Cauley-Stein because he's shooting 60% at the rim, which is horrible. So uh, he's an awful, he's an awful vertical athlete on offense because he times his jump wrong every time. Like Luca has to put the ball directly above the cylinder for him to dunk it. It's really funny. So about that audio snafu. So whatever just happened, Josh and I don't remember because it's <laughs> almost midnight, and you know, <laughs> Sorry, we're just, like we're talking like we're talking about the same thing every couple of days. <laughs> we are. Uh, yeah, and man, how. <laughs> Well, isn't it a little disappointing in the fourth quarter to see like the Suns kind of knew what to do down the stretch with Paul? Man, how good was Paul tonight? Twelve of thirteen right. from the free throw line, twenty nine points, twelve assists. He yeah. was pretty crappy actually through the first three quarters uh, shooting. I think he was like five of fourteen. Loose with the ball too. Yeah, really loose with the ball. Yeah, and then of course it's the last five minutes of a game, and he's two thousand eight Chris Paul again for the most part. Uh, that was frustrating, but. Yeah, I mean the Suns ten and twenty two from three from the Suns nine and twenty nine from the Mavericks. I mean that's I, we say this every single game. That's 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 a killer. And the Mavericks only got to the free throw line fourteen times, um, which I think is indicative of what we're talking about here. Like Luca doesn't have driving lanes, and no one else on this team is capable of taking the ball from the three point line 
and turning it into offense on a consistent basis. Uh, and that's, and that's a problem. So like if, and that's kind of, we, we expected there to be a little bit of a dip because of the way the Mavericks prioritized in the off season, but at the other end of the floor, you know, they got to play better defensively because the Suns kind of did whatever they wanted. Like you said, in the last three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I just, well, I think we ought to talk about the last thing. The only thing that really matters uh, in terms of something that, that I think, you know, I, I hope the Mavericks get fined for this. I hope that there's a little oh, bit of a story behind it. This we makes talk me about, mad. Oh, I mean, it's embarrassing. And Mark Cuban should be embarrassed. I'm going to repeat that. Mark Cuban should be embarrassed. He apparently directed the game ops team to turn off the sound when the Suns were shooting free throws. And the, at first it was it was funny. Uh, Jeff Skin Wade was, you know, making commentary like, like, he was in golf, like whispering because yeah, was like, was this just got, he was just like, this just got really awkward. Well, it went on for long enough to where at the first real break, Cuban walks to half, or not Cuban, Carlisle walks to half court and is like, enough of this. Tell them to turn it off or tell them to turn it back on. And then, you know, you, the, the camera panned to Cuban, who is sitting at half court, like, I mean, look, I get you're the owner. Come on, man go sit up in a box for this. That's just awkward. And he's yelling and he turns around. He's like, all right, tell him to turn it back on. And we're all kind of, you know, anybody that has the game feed, which comes through league pass, or if you're doing it through a less than legal stream, (laughs) you see, you see that sort of thing. And then at the, the next commercial break, uh, when they happens again, you hear Cuban yelling, tell, and I want to say it was the Suns head coach. Tell, tell him, I'm sorry. Tell him, I'm sorry. What? Like I'm 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 embarrassed. That's clown show right there. I mean that that's the sort of stuff that like I mean a team that actually is the worst in the league does. Yeah. I mean is this where we are? I, it's such a stupid thing to get mad about, but for me it's like how much do the Mavericks feed us um directly about their organization they are different, Kirk. Their organization, their philosophy, their culture, all that stuff, it's all different. Uh, you know, they're better. Uh, that's the, Ma- you know, there's the Mavericks way. Uh, there's standards, all that stuff. And with Carlisle, you believe it in terms of how he holds the team accountable and how he handles the locker room and stuff. But when your owner is doing these Bush League carny bullshit stuff during a game, like it's a... <laughs> like it's a Globetrotters game or like it's a G League game or something. Uh, that, like you said, I don't know what else to say. Other than that's embarrassing. Like, come on. Yeah. Like that's, it, re- it reeks of desperation that should be beneath a professional organization, especially one that has the recent history of the last 20 years of the Dallas Mavericks. Like I get that you've lost four in a row. You don't want to lose five, but come on. And I think Carlisle, telling him to turn it off and like making a point of it is really all you like that. That says it all. I think to me. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I feel like this probably would be a lesser thing if Cuban wasn't directly involved, but he clearly was. And I hate that. You know, if it's some, if it's some, if it's some, you know, assistant to the general manager type thing that, that we don't know who the person is, where it's just like somebody thought it'd be a cute idea or like some game, game day operator, you know, doing going rogue trying to have fun or something like who among us hasn't done a dumb thing in a job but no <laughs> it, it apparently was was mark cuban and i don't know man it, it's <sighs> it was you know, just you... like i was feeling okay like i'm st- i know you're i think you're way more bummed out about the loss than i am and i and i don't blame you like it was not a good good game uh in the fourth quarter especially but like i was like okay because i was like talking myself into well at least they gave they gave a crap. And especially after what Lucas said, uh, after the second jazz loss, like it was obvious that they had some fire in them a little bit. Uh, and they just slipped away from them from stupid mistakes that they made in the fourth quarter. But like for that to happen, it just soured the taste in my mouth and made me like, I, I don't want to be mad about that. Like, that's so stupid, but like, it made me mad. I don't know what to say. It's yeah. so stupid. Well, and then this is Don't this is it. just where we are because we're gonna have another period of days. You know, we have a shit. You know, the the Dallas Morning News has been pushing a Tim Kalashaw piece about how um, 
Luca needs to shoot better from three for the Mavericks to win. Maybe not fair of me to call it a bad piece, but if if the starting point is Luca needs to do better, then I don't believe in the thesis of the piece because it's <laughs> not like again, not the the guys going for twenty eight or twenty nine, eight and seven. Could he have played a little better? Sure. But then you look through the box score and it's like, where is the rest of the team doing anything? And I just thought there's, there's not a good answer for it. Yeah. There's, uh, yep. That's it. Uh, Suns had what? One, two, three, four, five players in double figures. Mathis had three. It's kind of the game. They lose by five yeah. or six yeah. or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. And they get to play the same team Monday. With presumably Devin Booker coming back. By the way, we didn't mention that. Devin Booker, the yeah. Suns' best player, uh, who torches the Mavericks all, uh, almost every time they play, did not play in this game. So just to. No, we're not, we, have, we have lots of games of evidence that teams don't need to play one of their better players against the Mavericks to win. So <laughs> until the Mavericks key. prove otherwise, until the Mavericks prove otherwise, this is just kind of where we are. <laughs> well, we should probably quit rambling. What do you think? Do you got anything else? No, that's about it. I I might I might take some plays and maybe throw something, some gifts, or I might just go to bed. But I'm kind of I would go to bed. I'm kind of done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. This is, if the Mavericks, you know, Luca apparently seems a little ha- little little happier in the post game stuff. But I, I, if I'm playing armchair psychologist, you know, Carlisle apparently had to talk in the pregame about how competitive Luca's statements are. You know, just because he's a really competitive guy, yada yada. It's probably to the point where Luca doesn't want to have to be like, all right, I, I need some help here because, you know, you can only do so much with what you have. And this is just sort of where the Mavericks are right now. Maybe they'll figure out a way out of it. Maybe they won't. And if they won't, if they won't, if they don't rather, then, you know, by around the 35 game mark, 15 to 20 more games, things are going to have to change in a huge, huge, huge way. Because if you're wasting a year of an MVP candidate's, uh, uh, rookie contract, there are some problems uh, that have to be addressed. It cannot be a, well, that's just the way it goes. It's a COVID season because this is more than just COVID. Yeah. Well, and we'll have to see. We just, they got to get this team back. They got, the last thing I'll say is they got to get this team back and playing some games with everyone at full strength before the trade deadline. Like they got to see what this team is and make like just, double that like double and triple check and make sure like is this for real uh but in the meantime they got to find a way to get out of this tailspin yep because that's not happening tomorrow it's not happening monday so (laughs) (laughs) well we'll be back monday night because they play (laughs) the suns again so this has uh been kirk and josh talking on mouse money ball after dark thanks so much for uh for joining in Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.